Um, how many of you know, and I'm sure I've shared this before, that as a teenager, um, I worked as a waiter? How many of you remember that story or stories? I probably, okay, good. I haven't told a story lately, so that's good because I plan to tell one now. I try to keep it hidden from my past, but sometimes it catches up with me. But my dad owned and operated an international house of pancakes. And so, I mean, I haven't, I mean, it's, it's 11 something, so I'm already thinking that what I could have eaten had I been um, near an IHOP this morning, hot cakes with blueberry syrup perhaps. As a kid, my favorite was the international omelet topped with cheese and picante sauce. But anyway, my dad owned the place, and so I got to work there. And I was, okay. I mean, I don't know that I was a good waiter, but I mean, I wasn't a bad waiter. Um, my dad kept me around, so apparently I wasn't awful. Uh, I know I made a few mistakes, like everybody else. Occasionally, I forgot to do something I told a customer I would do. But I can only remember spilling food on a customer one time. And I was bringing, you know, because we were taught to bring several plates at once, and I was bringing his food out to him and his family, and I just kind of lost my balance, and the plate hit the table at an angle, and so in slow motion, the food bounced off the plate, kind of like a trampoline, and the plate slid and hit his coffee cup, and it went towards him as well, and I started to go like this, if you can imagine in slow motion, all of this happening, and the food went, and the coffee went, and it just went splat all over him. And so he's got coffee, pancakes, um, probably eggs over his suit, over his tie, over his pants. I mean, he's a mess, and he goes ballistic. And I can't say I blame him, but he started calling me every name a football coach ever called me growing up. And he says, you know, this is, just look at this. This is the first chance I've had to wear this suit. It cost me $350. You've completely ruined it. And I'm going, sir, and I'm just trying to, you know, I'm trying to clean up. I'm probably making it worse. I'm just moving the food and the coffee on other parts of the table and on other family members probably. And he just says, get away. You've caused enough damage already, and his wife chimes in, that's right, it's a $350 suit. And I'm just like, you know, whoa, every, you know, I don't know what else to do. Everybody in the restaurant is watching this deal, and he says, I want to see the manager. I was like, whew, because I knew who the manager was, it's my dad. <laughs> so I said, okay, I didn't tell him that. And so my dad comes out, and he says, is there a problem? And I'm like, like can you not see that there is a problem here? And um, the guy says, this loser ruined my suit. Cost me $350. And so my dad says, well, we'll clean your suit for you, sir. You know, we're, I'm so sorry. We'll take care of that. And the, the guy says, no, I don't want my suit cleaned. I want a new suit. It's completely ruined. I want a check right now for $350. Well, my dad doesn't want to make a scene. So he leaves for a minute, and he comes back after... People have stopped watching, and he says, you know, sir, I, I can't do that. It, it was an honest mistake. We'll pay for the cleaning bill. We'll, of course, give you, you know, several free meals if you want, but I'm not giving you a check for $350. And the guy finally calmed down, and he took his wife, and he left. And I think the interesting part of the story as a 17-year-old is that this happened on a Sunday morning. And so why in the world would a guy be in a suit on a Sunday morning, do you think? Probably just came from hearing a great sermon on loving your neighbor as yourself. People who work in food service will tell you that the very worst people to wait on are the people who just got out of church on Sunday mornings. And Seth's agreeing. Thank you, Seth. Well, maybe not thank you, but appreciate you recognizing that's true. I wish it wasn't true. And that's really tragic because, friends, we're called to be different, right? We're called to be different in restaurants. We're called to be different at the ball field. We're called to be different at the golf course. We're called to be different in the classroom. We're called to be different in the office cubicle. The very first sermon Jesus ever preached, he said some countercultural things about being different and how being different brings true satisfaction and fulfillment and happiness in your life. Matthew 5 is a text, and we've, you know, I've preached on this a lot of times in, in, in bite sizes sometimes and as a whole, but um, you know, this is commonly referred to as the Beatitudes, this part of Matthew, of, of the Sermon on the Mount. And it's countercultural teaching. And so maybe we can read this together, if you don't mind. 
It's in your insert if you want to follow along. Now, when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will be called... Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I mean, if you, if you just read it at face value, it's, it's countercultural teaching. And I think Jesus may have laid these out as actual steps, like on a staircase of spiritual maturity. In terms of living life in a, counterculturally and walking with God our whole life. And so the question really for you today is, which step are you on? If you're a follower of Jesus, where, where are you? Which ones can you identify with most? And which ones are you leaning into, hopefully, in the coming year? He says, if you want to be happy, if you want to be fulfilled, it's a countercultural thing. The very first step is blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, how's that for starters? You want to be happy? Do you want to feel fortunate? Do you want to feel blessed? Do you want, do you want to be satisfied and fulfilled? You need to become poor in spirit. And what Jesus is saying here is that is more than happy are you, fortunate are you, blessed are you when you discover that you're spiritually busted. See, ultimately, it's the spiritually bankrupt who are happy. Jesus says, blessed are you when you get to the point in your life when you're spiritually bankrupt, when you reach, you know, in your spiritual pockets and you turn them inside out and all you have are are lint balls. You'll never, ever be happy in life until you recognize you're spiritually busted and you need God in your life. I mean, this is Jesus saying, listen, the the pride has got to drop. You've got to say, I need God. The, The very first step is blessed are the poor in spirit. And the next one is blessed are they that mourn. Those that mourn. Jesus is saying, if these are in logical progression like I think they are, what is he talking about here? Blessed are they that mourn over the fact that they're poor in spirit. Blessed are you when you recognize you need God and it starts to do something on the inside of you. It it breaks your heart. Like David said, God, what you really cherish is a broken heart and contrite heart. And when you get to that point where it, it, it isn't just head knowledge of, yeah, I think I need God, but it moves in your heart, and your heart starts to get real soft, and you weep over your sin, you're broken before God. I mean, I love it in Matthew 26, after Peter denies Jesus, it says that Peter went out and he wept bitterly. He just lost it over his sin. Have you ever done that? I mean, the reason why a lot of Christians are self-righteous is because they've never done this. They've never wept at their own sin. And when you weep at your own sin, you don't look at other people's sin the same way, do you? I mean, sometimes it just feels great to say, God, here's who I really am. Blessed are you when you mourn over the fact that you've discovered that you're poor in spirit, for you'll be comforted. And the third step is blessed are the meek. The meek. And, and I don't know what you think of when you hear the word meek, but I, I traditionally I think of the word weak. Don't you? Wimpy, like Barney Fife, you know, from the old days. But that's not what meek means at all. Meek, really, in the original Greek, meant to bridle wild horses, to put strength and power under control. And so Jesus is saying, once you discover you're poor in spirit and it does something in your heart, then it's time to come to God and say, God, I need you to control my life. And what we do in our culture when we realize something's not quite right spiritually is we dig down a little deeper, right? You know, as a culture, we tend to run to self-help. And haven't you discovered by now that self-help 
is an oxymoron. Self-help can't help. And because self can't help, that's why we get so frustrated with self-help. Because when you turn to self and ask self to help, self may offer some suggestions, but at the end of the day, self cannot help. And if you ask self to help and let self help and self wants to help, you're going to be in a big dilemma. You're going to start asking somebody else to help because self has helped you dig a bigger hole than you can get out of. And so self is unreliable, self is undependable, self cannot be trusted, self cannot accomplish anything eternal, self cannot muster up transformational power needed to live the kind of countercultural life Jesus is calling us to. If self-help could really help, then Jesus, is, would, Jesus would have just given us a, a gift card to Barnes and & Noble and said, go get a book and a latte, have a nice life. But self-help can't help, so Jesus said, blessed are you when you recognize that self can't help. And you say, okay, God, I'm going to become meek. I'm going to turn the controls over to you. I surrender my life into the potter's hands. T take me, mold me, fill me, use me. I yield my life to you. See, you'll never be happy in your life. You'll never have internal and eternal blessed feeling until you take those first three steps. Recognize that you need God. You're spiritually busted. Not only does it do something on the inside that the Bible calls confession and repentance and meekness that says, okay, I want to surrender to you, God. And when you take those first three steps, what a great day that is. When the old person is gone and the new person begins to take over, and Jesus Christ has forgiven us for all of our sin, and we sense this freedom in our lives. Now, we're forgiven by the amazing love of Jesus, but we're not automatically new people in the way we behave because we all still have some baggage along. And that's why step four is so important. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness who hunger and thirst after the ways of God. Your appetite starts to change. You're no longer really, really hungry over stuff like popularity. You're not really hungry anymore over prestige or power or materialism. You're not hungry for achievement and worldly success. You're hungry for the things of God now. And as you hunger for the things of God, you're going to get filled because you've discovered that those other things left you unsatisfied, but the things of God don't. They fill you up. And so as you hunger and thirst after God's right ways, as you renew your mind daily through the Word of God, as you let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, your life begins to change. And that's really the only way your life is ever going to change. You can take those first three steps and be completely forgiven and still live in the old way until you come to the point where you're hungry for God. You're thirsty for God. You renew your mind daily. You meditate on the laws of God. You just let it saturate your heart. You sing songs and worship, and he starts to transform you from the inside out. Now, in those first four steps, do you notice they're all inward things? Those are all things that happen on the inside of us. I would categorize those as the preparation phase of a Christ follower's life. But you don't stay there. There has got to be presentation of your life. And so what some Christ followers have a tendency to do is kind of skip the first four and jump over to the next four into what some authors call Christian behavioralism. You know, so I act like a Christian, but I don't have much of a foundation. I really don't know God. I know about Him, but I just kind of fake living like Him. But you can't skip the first four if you want to be an authentic Christ follower. And you can't skip the next four if you want your life to shine and glorify your Father in Heaven. Preparation is essential, and then presentation is essential too. 
so that people will see that you're living this radical countercultural life and you're happy and fulfilled and satisfied rather than just trying to act like that and they see through that facade because people can see through inauthentic living. So what's the first thing that comes out of your life in this presentation part? What does it say? Merciful. Isn't that cool? That's one of the first things that might come out of our lives after all the inside stuff's been going on. It's the very, it's the very first thing we already received from Christ, that mercy starts to come out of us. I mean, if you've ever sat through, I don't know, how many of you ever sat through a middle school camp talent show? Okay, yeah, there's more hands than I thought, okay? You could just, just saying those brought back memories, maybe some PTSD for some of us in youth ministry. You know what they can be like. They're like four hours long, and they're just bad. No offense to middle schoolers here. Love you guys, but, and some of you are really talented, but um, not all of you, okay? And I wasn't either. And I wasn't either. I was awful too, okay? This is not, a, I'm not picking on anyone in particular. But we did have one student, his name was Brian, and he had special needs, and he had an awful voice, okay? And, but he just wanted to sing, and, and I love this kid, and so we, you know, we, we thanked him for coming up. He wanted to sing a song, and this just shows you how old this was. Um, Bob will laugh, but he wanted to sing Michael W. Smith's Friends Are Friends Forever, okay? And if you know that song, then you know that song. And he had his karaoke uh, tape with him. This is way back in the day of the audio tape, okay? If you know what those are, young people. And he puts it in the boom box, and he hits play, and the music starts playing, and it was just awful. Off key, it's all over the map vocally. I mean, it's not even in rhythm, and it's not intentional. He's trying his best. He thought he was good. And so all the middle school kids started snickering, as you can imagine. But then Amy, this eighth grade girl, jumps up from the very back row. She runs down the aisle. She jumps up on the stage, throws her arm around Brian, grabs the microphone and starts singing with him, friends are friends forever because the Lord's the Lord of them. And she sang the whole song with him. And when they were done, nobody was laughing. There wasn't a dry eye in the camp that night. See, if God loves me, now I love you because of what's going on inside of me. I've got to love you. It's got to flow into my hands and my feet and my wallet and my actions. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. What's the next step? Blessed are the pure in heart. Now we're moving toward maturity here. Does pure in heart mean you never ever have an impure thought again in your life? Well, that wouldn't be true, or the Bible wouldn't say that we're to take captive every thought. The word purity here is really about sincerity, being honest with God. You're not covering up anything. You're always honest with God. You're honest with other people. You're just authentic. I mean, when I was in high school, you know, I lived with, with one foot in the light and one foot in the darkness. I could be whoever I needed to be, depending on whoever I was running with. And if I was with my, my church gang, I could be really, really good. And if I was with my other friends, I could be really, really not so good. Okay? And when you're living that kind of life, it's exhausting. It's much better just to put both feet in the light. And Jesus is saying, blessed are you when you're real because you can't see God when you're wearing a mask. And I'm not talking about COVID-related masks, okay? You know what I mean. The full mask. Blessed are you when you take that mask off of your life and you're a pure heart. You say, God, what you see is what you get. I'm trying my best to walk with you. You know everything about me. God, I'm not going to cover up anything. What God desires, as David said, is truth in the innermost parts. And then the next step, blessed are the peacemakers. Why do you think peacemakers is so far up there? It requires a lot of spiritual maturity, doesn't it? In fact, we lost a peacemaker this morning. Desmond Tutu passed away in South Africa. It requires a lot of spiritual maturity. He's, he's talking about the person that's slow to speak and quick to listen with a gentle spirit. Not many of these in our culture of outrage today. These people exemplify 
the fruit of the Spirit in their lives. They have great wisdom and great discernment. They just walk into a room and it can change. They're often the non-anxious presence in the room, if you know what I'm talking about. Something I have to work on. Because there are two kinds of people. I mean, this is an old children's message thing, but it's so true. I mean, there are two kinds of people. There are some people who are like thermometers and people who are like thermostats, right? What's a thermometer do? It just adjusts to the climate of the room. It just tells you the temperature. And what's a thermostat do? It sets the climate, the temperature of the room. And Jesus is saying, blessed are the thermostats. Blessed are the ones that can walk into any situation and just change the climate because they're so full of God and led by the Spirit. And then all the way to the top, blessed are the persecuted. Because when you're on top, people want to knock you off. And sometimes when people see Christ in you, they don't know how to handle you. Especially if you show up on the job and you have integrity and a great work ethic and you're kind of the curve breaker and you bring excellence to the job and you make them look bad or maybe someone tells a racist joke and you don't respond like they expect you to or you, or you step up or speak up for someone who's been marginalized or mistreated. Sometimes you even get persecuted because people don't know what to do with you. They just don't know how to handle that and they didn't know what to do with Jesus either. Do you know how many Christians are estimated to be killed for their faith each year worldwide? Center for, Global, Center for the Study of Global Christianity estimates that over 90,000 Christians are murdered for their faith every single year. Now that doesn't count those who are persecuted without being killed, right? People all over the world are per persecuted for the sake of Jesus Christ. Probably none of us could ever claim to be really persecuted, especially in the last year. But there are thousands of people all over the planet every day who get tortured or beaten for Christ. I prayed with one of them. His name was Daniel. He was a pastor in the underground church of China. He had been tortured and imprisoned several times. This was back in the 90s. But that didn't stop him from living a life of joy and hope. And when I prayed with Daniel, he did most of the praying for me. He risked his life every day because he loved Jesus Christ. I would love to get to the point in my life, and hopefully I'm there now, where I'd say, Jesus, if persecution comes into my life, then bring it on because I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Around 1995, Bob Moorhead published this. The author of this work, it's a little bit of a mystery. If you, if you look this up, I can help you, but maybe some urban legend around it, but whoever wrote it, I thought it was brilliant, but the most, the, the closest I can come to the original author is a Rwandan man in 1980 who was forced by his tribe to either renounce Christ or face certain death, and he refused to renounce Christ, and he was killed for his faith, and this is what he had written before his execution, and it's called The Fellowship of the Unashamed. I hope this statement is true of me and you, but this is what he wrote. I am part of a fellowship of the unashamed. I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of Jesus, and I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed, my present makes sense, and my future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living, sidewalking, small playing, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame divisions, mundane talking, cheap giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotion, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, lean on his presence, walk by patience, live by prayer, and labor by power. My faith is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, and my companions are few, but my God is reliable and my mission is clear. I can't be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, 
deluded or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of the adversary, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, or let up until I've pray, stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, and preached up for the cause of Christ. I'm a disciple of Jesus. I must go till he comes, give till I drop, preach till all know, and work till he stops me. And when he comes for his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My colors will be clear. I hope that's a commitment we can make. And if not, you know, which step are you on? We may be at different places in our journey, and that's okay. But hopefully our prayer at some point that we'll be all be able to pray is that, God, I recognize that I need you. It's broken my heart. My life is in your hands. God, I'm hungering for you. I'm thirsting for you. Turn me into a loving machine where I'm loving people all day long. God, turn me into a person who's real all the time, not trying to live a phony kind of life. God, turn me into the kind of person who's a thermostat. And God, if persecution comes my way, then so be it, because I'm starting to look a lot like Jesus. And so the man stood there, you know, with syrup dripping all over his suit that had been ruined by my mistake. But another man stood there one day, blood running down his forehead, off of his chin, all over his robe. It wasn't ruined by accident. It was on purpose. And he paid the price for our sins. Why? Because Jesus was different. And he calls us to be different too. Let's pray. Jesus, as we enter a new year, a new beginning, in a sense, a new way to look at things, hopefully, for all of us, Lord, that we would see your presence preeminent in our lives, and that would mark us and change us. Lord, as we think about what life will be like at the end of 2022, it's hard to imagine, <laughs> but as we look at our own personal spiritual lives and we think ahead a year, may we be able to say, next year at this time, that we're more like your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.